Telecast, the TV industry news review. Is the TV industry doing its bit in the war on climate change? What are the most carbon intensive types of programming? And how can the industry help tackle the biggest global issue facing us all? On this week's show, I'm chatting with sustainability operations and project manager at BAFTA Albert, Katie Murdoch, and director of content operations at Sky Studios' Be Divine, as we discuss how to measure and address unsustainable production and Sky going net zero carbon by 2030. It's all coming up on this week's Telecast. In the past year or so on Telecast, we've covered off a lot of issues to do with the fast-evolving content industry and how businesses are getting through and, in some cases, benefiting from the COVID crisis. But one subject that we haven't yet touched on and one that's bigger than all of that and indeed seeks to address the existential threat we're all facing is climate change and the issue of sustainability in TV production. And it's something that I've been meaning to to cover on the show for quite a while and delighted to discuss this and what the content industry is doing and what more can be and should be done is sustainability operations and project manager at BAFTA Albert, Katie Murdoch, and director of content operations at Sky Studios, B Divine. Welcome to Telecast, Katie and B. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. Great to have you on the show. Thank you for sparing some time to talk about this really important issue. Katie, starting with you, can you tell us about the Albert standard? Because this is something that I've been aware of that BAFTA has has been championing and a number of producers that I've come across and worked with in the past have, have been working with the Albert Standard, but perhaps not all of them. So can you tell us a little bit about the Albert Standard, what it is and how it came about? Yeah, sure. First off, though, I'm really pleased that you headlined this as, as being a huge crisis because amongst COVID, you know, the climate crisis is indeed the biggest uh, biggest threat to humanity we're facing at the moment. And while it might seem like we've got more pressing issues at, at times, um, particularly in our industry under the under COVID, um, the climate crisis is looming unless we do something about it. So Albert was formed a decade ago, actually started at Edinburgh Festival in 2011. So we, ah. yeah, and we, as you say, are, are hosted by BAFTA. That means they give us all the good stuff like HR provision and IT and look after us, nurture us. But we're an industry funded project and we are the industry project for sustainable production. We have a very much two pronged approach. We started as a carbon calculator tool, which allows productions to work out the greenhouse gas emissions associated with making their productions. And of course, measuring is the first step to managing. So that was very much sort of first steps. And it's still a crucial first steps for production on this journey. But we we have two main aims now at Albert formed over the last decade. And one is is helping production to eliminate the the greenhouse gases and environmental impact associated with with creating content, which isn't uh, inconsiderable. But we also recognise that as well as a negative footprint, that our industry has what I like to call a brain print. And this means the the influence and the um, opportunity, really, to inspire audiences towards sustainable living. So now, Albert, and we're, a, we're an 11 strong team now, um, we, and we're, we're um, based around the UK as a team and, and actually have a colleague in Barcelona as well. But we um, have a suite of tools and um, offerings, if you like, uh, to help with these two aims. And it's not just the carbon footprint um, calculator now. We we have we do certification, but we also we also help on this editorial endeavor towards um, using our influence for sustainability. That's really, really clear in terms of the two areas that you work in. And uh, and obviously everybody's familiar with the impact that some of the programming that we've seen to David Attenborough obviously comes to mind to begin with uh, as programming that can really affect change. But when it comes to the production of those shows, some 
people have said in the past that to produce some amazing natural history programming, it means that you've got to fly crews or po- pre-COVID had to flown crews from all over the world to Borneo, let's say, to to cover off some you know some incredible footage and nat- natural history uh, footage. But the actual impact that that's had on from a carbon perspective has been you know probably the most damaging if you like of of any kind of program but so it's obviously you know it's a just juxtaposition there can, what's the impact that tv production has on carbon emissions i mean can it be broken down can we quantify it alongside other other industries in terms of how damaging it is yeah absolutely so that's what carbon footprinting does it's that first step as i said in 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 our management process but Albert um, gathers carbon footprinting data from thousands of of productions um, in the UK, but also increasingly internationally every single year. This allows us to aggregate data and run reports and all the the juicy stuff. If you're looking across genre or across production method, on average, the carbon intensity, that means the carbon emissions associated with an output of TV in, in this case, one hour of TV across all genres is is about 10 tonnes of CO2. That still might sound like jargon. So what does 10 tonnes equate to? On average in the UK, one person emits about 10 tonnes of CO2 and that, that constitutes their heating in their home, their travel, everything they, they eat and everything that they buy as well, such as washing machines and TV sets. The one hour of TV in the UK is equivalent to one person living in the UK for a year. Wow, that sounds like a lot to me. I mean, it's it's uh, it's difficult to quantify, I suppose, when you put it like that. But you know, one hour of TV equals ten tons of carbon emissions. Yeah, it, it it now there's nuances there, as you pointed out. There's different genres come with different impacts, and indeed different production methods. So, as you said, those productions like natural history where there's a lot of flying around the globe of camera and kit and crew Mm. they do come with a larger carbon footprint than for example an archive based show or a news based program uh, for an hour when we compare them but we have to be mindful that that there's a positive impact Uh, with natural history it can be a connection with the natural world it can be case of Blue Planet 2 pointing out some uh, some environmental disasters. So Albert's not here to say those shows mustn't go on. We're here to help reduce the carbon footprint, but also increase that positive impact. In terms of shows that are produced in the UK, and I know you're mainly focused in the UK, you, you mentioned that, that you do have somebody in Barcelona, and, and are there any other similar organisations that are doing a similar thing in different territories around the world? There are. Alberts, as I said, has been going for a decade now. We have a team of employees and we're kindly hosted by BAFTA. But there is um, a sustainable production alliance in America um, that works predominantly just with the studios. But um, we, we work with our, our partners across the pond. We're, we're certainly not in a competitive space here. It's all about sharing knowledge and and working together, really. On this endeavour. Yeah, it's obviously a fantastic movement. And uh, and I do know, as I say, a, lot, a number of businesses that I've worked with in the past are Albert compliant, if you like. What percentage of shows produced in the UK currently are Albert compliant? Do you have those sort of figures? It's a hard figure to come by, actually, without us going to every single um, broadcast member of ours to work out how many commissions they had in the year. But sitting, we're, we're funded by industry. Sitting on Albert's directorate, that means that those uh, members responsible for shaping our strategy are major UK broadcasters, including Sky, Discovery, Netflix, Apple UK, BBC Channel 4, ITV, uh, UK TV, and I've no, ch- I've no doubt missed one, <laughs> BT Sport as well. And, and these members fund us and have also, um, the majority of whom, have set mandatory certification requirements. So that means their productions and commissions must get Albert certified. So we are quite confident that in terms of UK broadcast industry, we're capturing uh, a lot of production. Now, of course, there's productions that are outside of 
major UK broadcasters, such as as a lot of short film content. Um, and they're the members um, and productions that, that we find it a bit trickier to reach. Um, you know, they have even more freelancers. So we're, we're certainly working on a strategy to, to capture them as well. Okay. And so there is a quota in place, essentially, when it comes to broadcasters that are part of, of your organisation. So they demand certain standards of their suppliers as well. That's how we work. Yeah, that's our stick, if you like. Yeah. Okay. And and how about Netflix? They st- spring to mind as as being obviously having a lot of big productions going on in the UK. Are they part of this, or or are they yet to to make this a, a priority? Netflix uh, productions in the UK get Albert certified, and we Netflix sits on our, our consortium and directorate. They're obviously doing quite a lot of work on their own internal Net Zero strategy, um, as well as production. Um, strategy for for sustainability but also of course looking at streaming emissions as well which is of particular pertinence to them as well as part of part of our industry's carbon footprint. Well coming to you B obviously Sky has become you know very vocal and and you know taking a leadership role I think when it comes to the international broadcast and content industry. You've got a program called Sky Zero, haven't you? And this is something sustainability has been, you know, obviously pretty uh, high on your agenda for a number of years. Can you tell us about what Sky Zero is and what you guys are doing? Absolutely, Justin. And, you know, Sky was the first media company to go carbon neutral in 2006. And now we want to be net zero carbon by 2030. And Sky Zero is the program that covers that journey towards our net zero carbon targets. And of course, you know, protecting the environment is something that matters to me personally. And it's huge for Sky. And it's not just in the UK and it's in it's across the group. And also we're working very closely with our NBCU and Comcast partners. Um, within production, we work very closely with Katie and the Albert team, of course, and all our Sky originals in the UK uh, do require Albert certification. So we made this mandatory. And of course, working with Albert, we're expecting carbon neutral outcome for all titles. And in January this year, we announced our sponsorship of COP26, along with new sustainable production principles and a new plan- planet test that we have launched. And I think these are all a journey. We're not going to get there. And like Katie said earlier, it, there's a lot that can be done. The whole industry is trying, but it's still new. And I, I personally think this is an opportunity to work more collaboratively industry-wide than ever. And I think we, are, we all have our little bits to input into this. It's interesting, isn't it, that we've been through COVID and everybody's, you know, uh, had various different priorities and agendas. And, and actually, I think many th- many people in the industry have, have looked at their priorities, both as individuals and also as businesses as well. Surely now would be the time for the rest of the industry, because it, it, it doesn't seem to be barring Sky, barring Albert, and barring one or two other broadcasters out there, it doesn't seem to be as high on the agenda as perhaps it should when it is such an existential issue that we're all dealing with. And as you say, uh, the big uh, uh, COP event is happening this year. Do you think that's going to have a an impact on the rest of the TV industry, B, when it comes to as other businesses really stepping up and other parts of the industry, not just producers and broadcasters, but other parts of the industry stepping up and really taking much more of a, an active approach to this. Absolutely. And, you know, it's it's our responsibility, especially for big companies like Sky. Uh, we need to take leadership position in this and lead by example, perhaps. And that's why when we launched our sustainable production guidelines and the planet test that we apply to each title as Sky Originals, we've made them available online for everyone to use and adapt. And I think I'm hoping that people will take this and use it and run with it. It's not necessarily a Sky thing. 
everyone has a part to contribute into this. And as part of our sustainable production principles, we've made a lot of materials available that we've collated over the years. We've worked with the Albert team to give some guidance into productions and what can they do in pre-production, what can they do during the production, after production, and how can they put some messaging to consumers at home, to people who are watching this content and what messages can be taken to them to raise awareness, show the actions. And also we're looking at what we can do around the content, whether we can use Albert logo at the end of the, each title and sustainability statement on all programs and use our talent for messaging to people at home watching this again. So there's there's a lot that can be done. And I think we can only lead by example and hope that by raising awareness, we will take everyone on this journey along with ourselves. And I think Albert have a key role in this as well perhaps to pull everyone in the industry. The other thing to remember, I think, is Sky obviously isn't just the studios. It's a full broadcaster, and there's also this, the set-top boxes and uh, everything else that is involved in the Sky ecosystem, all of your operations, even when it comes to the vans, uh, the engineers that are driving around the UK and other territories around the world as well. So it's it's actually really quite an undertaking isn't it the sky zero to actually become net zero carbon in another nine years time to me i don't i don't see many other companies really going this far to make this sort of effort this must be driven from the very top of the the business how 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 do you transform a business as big as sky to actually deliver on all of these uh, on, on these ambitions it's it's a massive transformation project, like you said, Justin. And I think we started with establishing a governance and it applies to not just products, our engineers, home service and productions, but every department across Sky. And I think our initial approach to this was to understand the footprint and reach of every area, look at how we, you know, what are the key value drivers across every business area and also how can we track the metrics and do a forecast. We we are now in that 2030 detailed play, planning phase in terms of what we have to do each year to get to, to that zero target. And of course, it's not a quick fix. It's definitely not a quick fix. And everyone have big targets at Sky. But I think we kind of encourage and engage each other because I think Sky is a very ambitious company. I think we all thrive off that drive from each other. You know, if one department is saying, oh, we've got plans, we may reach that sooner. The other departments are following from behind saying, oh, okay, we need to better them. And I think that ambition, I think, is fantastic. And I think we are all in this together. And it's a global crisis. It's not necessarily just reaching a business target. So I think, you know, it's not just our businesses, it's our children and it's our future at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, it's a shared goal, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. One thing that I see every morning when I, you know, speaking for myself, I'm afraid I drive a diesel car still. I wish I could buy an electric car, but the infrastructure is not there. But that's another, that's a whole different, whole different conversation. But I'm based at Elstree Studios in uh, Boreham Woods, uh, just north of London, and I'm seeing every day at the moment the most enormous construction project going on to create the new Sky Studios complex. It's a very impressive construction site at the moment. Um, how many stages? Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and, and that project? Because in its own right, creating something from scratch that is going to be sustainable is again another uh, another challenge absolutely it's a very very exciting project justin and i think it's along with all our other bold commitments of course sky studios elstree is going to be the home 
to accommodate all our production needs, not just for Sky, but also NBCU and wider uh, industry where there's availability. And our ambition here is to build the world's most sustainable film and TV production studios when it opens next year. So on on the site, we've got 13 stages, a couple of warehouses and multiple production office buildings. It, to sort of put that in context, it's the size of 17 football pitches. So it's a big space. And we've got a good big piece of work that we're doing with Albert to create a studio sustainability scorecard. And I think with that, we want to get all the studios and stages globally to have a way to measure track in multiple areas because on site we will be using solar energy wherever possible. We'll generate approximately 20% of our energy and storage in store it store this in large batteries rather than relying on traditional generators. And for everything else, we'll use renewable electri- electricity. And for all our logistics vehicles, we'll use electric vehicles and we'll use on the LED lighting where possible, of course, and we will encourage that all the time. And we will be harvesting rainwater on site. And of course, we will ban single use plastics on our operations. We're looking deeply into waste management. And we are also trying to be creative with how we are working on our individual productions to see whether we can reuse sets rather than building from scratch every time and you know create an all asset management system to perhaps repurpose what we have across Sky and NBCU productions. I think this is a whole big beast ahead of us, but it's it's a big ambition and we are very, very excited about it. Justin, you're right to bring up the studios, though, because there's only so much production can do without the infrastructure to support. And the studio scorecard that we're working on with with Sky and Sony and others um, is, is all about transparency, really, and this, this collaborative learning from each other, because you can't be perfect in this space, because sometimes the technology doesn't exist. Like you were saying, you're yet to buy an electric vehicle, because perhaps the charging stations aren't in place, perhaps it's too cost prohibitive at the moment. But all we can do is do our best at the moment, so we can, um, it's it's better to be hypocritical, I say, rather than cynical, and <laughs> do, do what we can rather than do nothing. And the studio scorecard, of which Sky sounds like it's going to score very highly on, will will actually rate transparently studios around the world on different sustainability metrics like renewable energy and all the the stuff be just listed. And, you know, it's showing that our industry is not about greenwashing, uh, as opposed to many other industries out there, and that we're going to be transparent in this endeavour to hopefully share learning. And it's, I mean, it's an interesting time for studios, isn't it, at the moment, because there's, there's huge demand for studios. I mean, every day I saw one was was opened in Farnborough today, and uh, the, I know there's huge demand and everybody's queuing up to, to try and get their productions on a uh, soundstage. Equally, a lot of the infrastructure around studios, certainly in the UK, and I would imagine this is similar in many other territories, is it's pretty old, you know. It's been it's it's actually been built around maybe sixties, sixties certainly in Elstree. I mean, it's 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 be, it goes back to the sort of the post-war years. That's a big challenge for them, isn't it? In terms of bringing studios into the sustainable age, if you like, because they do feel some of them feel a little bit old, a bit little bit crumbling. And they need a bit of a a green makeover, let's say. It is, but it's marginal gains as well. You know, every little bit that anyone can do is going to add up. And I think you can't necessarily knock what there is and rebuild those studios, but you can start using green energy and, you know, transitioning. And like our 2030 plan at Sky, I think it's every business's responsibility to put a plan in place and perhaps work slowly over the years it's not going to happen overnight and in some ways we need to go back in time because some things the old studios did studio systems did were were actually very sustainable like having prop houses on site where new productions would come in and just repurpose props sets costumes and going back to that circular way of uh, producing is actually what we need in some cases 
Well, maybe the 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 efforts that many producers and many in the content industry have ha- have been forced to go through during the COVID crisis and within various guidelines, it just shows you what can actually be achieved when you've got your back against the wall and you have to comply with certain rulings. Maybe that that's that's the way forward to actually speed up the more, more sustainable production. But, but I mean, we've been talking about production and obviously the content industry is much bigger than that, isn't it? What about the other areas of the content industry, Katie? That uh, I mean, Albert is purely concerned with producing programming. But what about things like events, publishing, distribution industry? What about all of these areas? Because they've all got their own role to play as well, haven't they? They have. They all come with with um, a footprint for sure, and that's that's where Sky setting ambitious net zero targets is so crucial because it um, encapsulates all parts of the supply chain up and down. Um, the, there's a great project at the moment with the Carbon Trust in connection with Bristol University who are looking at streaming emissions. Um, and actually, they've just released a paper this week that um, that shows it's actually about the device that you view content through is actually more important in terms of a carbon footprint than, than the, the transmission and distribution areas so watching content through a tablet is actually better even if it's streamed than watching through a big all singing or dancing lcd set top box um so there, there are other organizations who are looking at different parts of the chain i guess this past year has given us all a pause for thought on how we can help reduce the impact on the environments because we used to go to a lot of events such as mipcom and some industry conferences etc flying globally and we didn't have to go to any of those and they have mostly taken place and there's been no need to distribute the printed material for these and in fact at last MIPCOM Jane Millerchip who's our chief content officer she urged the industry to ban plastics and corporate tat in all these events and markets and I guess we were able to attend more events more efficiently I think I have been globally involved on so many more partnerships, discussions, meetings, events, etc., and worked so much more effective over the last year with COVID. And I'm hoping we all maintain this going forward. We don't necessarily need to all travel. And you can see so many more people in a small screen at your own home. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that is something that I've mentioned a few times on the show before is that about three, four years ago, you could meet some distribution execs who were literally hopping from one event to another, almost all around the year. Just the number of air miles, all you know, and everything that's involved in that to these events that were using non-sustainable materials. So it's a, it really does sort of lay it bare. And hopefully, as you say, now we we're, we're, we're maybe uh, concentrated. Our minds are maybe a little bit concentrated to being more sustainable when we actually come out of this and we can all start to go to these events again and uh, and the industry starts to adapt to this new normal. And now it's time in the show for Katie and B to pick their stories of the week, the TV industry news item that's caught their eye in the past seven days. Katie, what's your story of the week? Well, just in mind is Jeremy Clarkson's new farming show, on Amazon Prime, and I never thought I'd be saying this, but <laughs> he, I, the reason I've picked this is because Jeremy Clarkson is, he's been important, let's say, in, in car culture in the UK, and was um, a climate sceptic, uh, even outright denier a number of years yeah. ago. That was until he filmed in Cambodia and firsthand saw the effects of climate change as he was trying to cross a dried up river for one of his productions. He's still not an eco-warrior, and he has battles, quite vocal battles with, with the vegan movement, for example. But to see him doing a farming show, and I watched the first episode last evening, where he talks about climate justice for farmers, he talks, he sees firsthand the, the impacts of, of down, pouring rainfall on the crops. Uh, he, he argues for the plight of farmers. He argues against industrialised farming. It's quite a journey. And we're not going to get everyone, all our audiences, to um, think about sustainable living if we only put 
vegans and, and eco warriors on screen. We do actually need um, different people telling different stories. And that's going to be the way we inspire every sort of tranche of society to come on this journey. So seeing someone like Clarkson's journey from climate denier to, to farming, uh, I thought it's quite radical. Mm, no, absolutely. And uh, uh, and it's actually got some really good reviews I've seen. We'll put a link, actually, to uh, for everybody to go and have a look at the, uh, at the uh, new Jeremy Clarkson series. How sustainable Amazon is? That's another question altogether. But um, anyway, how about you, B? What's your story of the week? My story of the week is actually ITV Daytime welcoming their first green satellite vehicle. Um, I think we've been doing all we can at Sky and we've got our targets as well. But to see the four cars of ITV Daytime's current fleet have been replaced, I think that sort of gives us a bit of a push. And In our production and content Net Zero Carbon Working Group meeting today, we were discussing, okay, we need to set targets for all fleet vehicles to be electric by 2024 within sports. News are already doing some fleet of hybrid cars, uh, crew cars and green diesel being in use. But I think we will need to expand that. I'm, I'm taking this as a good example for us and to the whole industry. Right, fantastic. Well, this is uh, this is all good. We've got green stories of the week, which isn't a surprise. Thank you for those. <laughs> and now it's time of the show where my guests get to nominate their heroes of the week and who or what they're telling to get in the bin. B, who's your hero of the week? Well, my hero of the week is the G7 Summit uh, and the global leaders pledging to share a billion COVID vaccines with the poorer nations internationally. You can always see the world leaders desperate to be the first to announce their particular part of that, couldn't you, with Biden and then Boris Johnson, but then everybody together. Absolutely. And uh, as we've we've discussed on the show before and on, on the Telecast Plus newsletter that you know, until everybody's vaccinated, it's not just a local problem, it's a global pro- problem, much like carbon emissions and and climate change that's uh, the g7 summit is your hero of the week and and who or what are you telling to get in the bin oh it's the rising covid cases following the bank holiday crowds and the extension of the restriction four week period for me it's ongoing i i think we're all very keen to move on and get back to the new normal now and perhaps focus on sustainability rather than covid issues Exactly. We we'll just get just we just want everybody to get jabbed, don't you? Just want everybody to uh, to for us to achieve this immunity. Oh, definitely. It's going in the right direction, but I think it's not going as fast as we would like it to. <laughs> no, maybe we should take a leaf out of uh, California or various other uh, U.S. states who have actually got lotteries for people to get vaccinated. You get to, you get vaccinated, you get a free entry to a one and a half million dollar lottery which is uh astonishing but uh but there we go whatever it takes right whatever it takes to get everybody jabbed how about you katie who's your hero of the week mine is gareth southgate and his open letter head of the euros to called dear england and that's because he recognizes that that there's an influence of footballers and football managers beyond just the game and just winning and he's used that influence to talk about diversity, inclusivity, equality. We work with a sports consortium at Albert who are so engaged and passionate because they see the first-hand impacts of climate change on their sports, but use their influence to, to talk about climate change and sustainability through commentary, through actually the sports people themselves being passionate about the endeavour. And um, I, I, I'm just... I blubbed when I read his letter. I really did. I thought, what a beautiful way of using your, your influence. Now, that was real leadership, wasn't it? It was, it was true leadership, what you saw from Gareth Southgate, who, you know, who's everybody's got a lot of time for him. He seems a decent guy. But when he put that together, you're absolutely right. It's had, I think it's had a real impact. And hopefully, as we go forward, the message will get through to some of these people that are still booing the England team for taking the knee. Anyway, who... Or what are you telling to get in the bin? Mine is uh, on the theme of the G7 summit, but it's the person who's responsible for Boris Johnson's Twitter slash photography and press because 
On his arrival, there was a tweet from Boris Johnson's Twitter to say, looking forward to the G7 summit, to, to building a fairer and greener world post-COVID. And there was an image of him getting off a domestic flight mm. to Cornwall. Mm. And, I, you know, that's a complete lack of joining the dots up there because it's domestic flying that, that's really contributing to, to national um, climate change and carbon footprint emissions. And we really need to tackle it in the UK particularly. Hopefully the new infrastructure that they're building, the trains, HS2, well, that's a whole other uh, area for us to get into. But I think, you know, in terms of getting people off those domestic flights and getting people back on the trains and obviously electric vehicles is is going to be a massive help. And that's what the Queen did, actually. The Queen travelled home by train from the G7 summit. She was nearly my hero of the week for doing that. <laughs> Good for her. Maybe uh, Boris can take a, a leaf out of her book. Katie B, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really enjoyed discussing this with you. I mean, it's a, it's a huge subject. We could we could talk about it for a lot longer, and there's lots of other areas that I've probably not even mentioned that are worthy of much more discussion when it comes to climate control and basically the uh, the efforts that we all need to go to. But really fascinating to hear about the content industry, what Sky's doing, what Albert's doing, and we'll put some links to various pages on your websites that people can go to and check out more information about how to be more sustainable when it comes to production. So thanks very much for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Well, that's about it for another week's show. As always, thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to Telecast and share it with friends and colleagues. And a quick reminder to sign up for our free newsletter called Telecast Plus. It's packed with interesting TV industry stories of the week you may have missed, downloadable reports and surveys, and exclusive insight and opinion. And it's all completely free. Just visit our website to sign up at telecast-podcast.com. That's telecast-podcast.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in London. Until next Thursday, as always, stay safe.